I would like to request uh, uh, the ones with their mics that are still on to mute them, and then you only unmute when you wish to ask a question or to contribute, because there's a bit of noise in the background. Great, so we were looking at the consultant. So um, starting with the architect, basically um, architects are usually the lead uh, consultants who uh, you know, prepare the basic designs for you know, your development, whatever it is. Uh, they come up with the schemes and uh, by, you know, guide you in terms of how you can best utilize your site. Uh, they give you visuals of how you know, your project uh, would, uh, would uh, look like. Uh, when it is uh, constructed. Uh, so essentially that is what an, an architect would do. And I'll just guide you through that entire process. And uh, uh, ideally uh, they should do it until uh, you've moved to your, uh, to your building or to your development or you've taken over your development. Uh, the civil and structural engineers would pick up the designs by the architects and uh, what they would do is they would design the structural elements of, of, of uh, the development. Uh, these you're looking at uh, the columns, you're looking at the beams. Uh, the question is how big should they be? What kind of uh, steel reinforcement should they have? How many reinforcement bars, uh, for instance, should a column have? Or should a beam have? Or should the slab have? So all these calculations and uh, designs are usually worked out. Uh, by the civil and structural engineer. And then we have a mechanical and electrical engineer. Uh, essentially, these ones, they look at uh, your electrical works. Uh, you know, how much power do you require in your, in your uh, development? How should the power come in? You know, what kind of cables in terms of sizes should you have? You know, what systems do you need for backup? How do you connect, you know, uh, to, to, to power backup systems and so on and so forth? So that is what the electrical engineer is going to design and, and, and come up with. Uh, mechanical engineer looks at how does water come into your, your building and how does it go out as, as, uh, as waste. So they would look at your plumbing. Uh, you know, do you have hot water uh, systems? How do they work? Are they solar? How are they connected to you know, the other systems? Do you have you know, water reservoirs? How do you bring in water into your building? And of course, how do you take out the water in terms of waste? Uh, waste being solid waste, you know, from toilets, and also uh, liquid waste from, uh, you know, bathrooms, sinks, and so on and so forth. Uh, the quantity surveyor would then pick up all, all, all that information and quantify it into, you know, quantities right. and uh, give you cost estimates. So, the end product of a quantity survey is usually the bill of quantity. And the bill of quantity has two critical uh, purposes. The first one is to allow you as a developer just to have a very good idea of how much would it cost you to put up your, your project. Then secondly, uh, quantity surveyors would produce another document which you call the blank bill of quantities, uh, a document which now you use to procure building contractors. So you'd get the document and then you'd give it out to maybe two or three uh, contractors and ask them to give you quotations. And then you evaluate and see who, you know, possibly serves you best. And then you select. But this is a process that, you know, the consultants then definitely are able to help you out. Then, of course, you have an interior designer. Uh, traditionally, architects were interior designers, but, uh, you know, things have evolved. And, uh, you know, you have... Uh, people who are specifically handling that trade of interior design and they look at, uh, but when architects, we look at the exterior and the structure and how, you know, uh, these things come together design-wise. The interior wow. designer then would look at, uh, you know, how do your floors, how do your walls and ceilings, uh, you know, look and how do they make you feel? So that is their role uh, within the, the, the construction of, of a project. Then we have some other, consultants who we we consult you know once in a while you have the geotechnical surveyor who tests our soil 
Uh, at times, if you get into a project without doing proper tests, uh, but, you know, you might start construction and as you're doing your foundation, you find a very huge, massive rock uh, that becomes too expensive to, 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 you know, blast. Or you can find loose soil that is too deep and, and you hadn't planned, you know, for all those um, scenarios. Then it becomes very, you know, costly and, and, and maybe we didn't have budgeted for it. Uh, if, if you used a design that did not consider that, possibly even to obtain financing, uh, then you realize that the financing you obtained is not uh, going to be adequate to, to, to you know, conclude your project, then it becomes a problem. So it's important uh, to consult some of these surveyors. Uh, we have planners. Planners, we use them when we are dealing with issues of you know, uh, general uh, planning and zoning. Um, or you might have bought a piece of land that was previously uh, agricultural and, and you'd want to do a certain kind of development. So you have to do what is called a change of user. Essentially, it's just to notify the authorities that this is what you want to do. And then based on the plans or the guidelines that they have, then they will tell you whether they're able to support that facility. For instance, if you're doing a multi a uh, residential project that's like apartments in an area that was initially zoned for single dwellings. So on the same plot, say half an acre, uh, now you're bringing in 20 or 30 families, whereas previously there have just been one family. So the planning authorities then would consider all those factors. And, and, and the person that you need for you to be able to make that application would usually be the planner. And then uh, for a number of projects, you need environmental impact assessment. Uh, these are projects that uh, are you know, massive in nature that are going to have some impact on the environment. So you need to satisfy uh, the agencies that uh, actually what it is that you're doing is not going to have any negative impacts. And if there are going to be any, then how are you planning to mitigate uh, those uh, negative impacts? So for that, you would also uh, consult an environmental impact assessment expert. And then uh, the other projects, which are usually specialty projects, um, for instance, if you're putting up a, a, a hotel or a lodge, if you're putting up a hospital, if you're putting up an educational institution, at times it's important to bring in a consultant who understands that trade, you know, a hotelier or a health expert or an education expert, uh, people who can give you that uh, uh, trade specific uh, input that you might not get from any uh, of the consultants above and, and, and they would help these consultants as they develop their concepts uh, for whatever projects that you have. So I, in, in quite a number of cases and mostly from my experience where I've worked with trade consultants is uh, in uh, hospitality projects uh, where we are doing lodges or hotels. Uh, then we get someone who has, uh, you know, had this experience in running these facilities to come in and give their input at the very early stage. So in terms of how you go about selecting these consultants, um, the main consultant that uh, majority of people uh, choose would usually be the architect uh, because this would come in as the lead consultant. And in smaller projects, they would ask the architect now to, uh, to uh, come with their own team of other consultants who they can easily work with. Uh, in other projects which are big in nature, uh, you'd find that they would uh, try and select independently each of these different, uh, different consultants. Um, how you go about it, there are you know, many different ways. I think uh, in this day of age and technology, uh, this age of technology, people do a lot of Google searches. Uh, where you just uh, go through uh, what uh, these consultants have, you know, posted in their websites and in their pages and, you know, talk to them, uh, look through their works and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, prof the, the database for professional bodies. And in our case, uh, either the Architectural Association of Kenya or the Board of Registration uh, of Architects that would uh, you know, be one of the areas where you can get uh, you know, this list of registered and credible uh, consultants that you can work with. A very good way of uh, getting consultants also is reference. Uh, you know, when you are working on these projects at times, 
you need to work very closely with, with uh, your consultants. So uh, at times it's good to get reference from friends, uh, you know, from family members, you know, people who've done projects similar to yours, where you can actually go and have a look at the project that, you know, the same consultant has worked on and you satisfy yourself that, yeah, you know, this, they can do it. And then you, you know, settle on them. Um, uh, so basically these are some of the ways uh, through which you can, you can do your uh, consultant selection. In terms of <coughs> the permits that you'd require uh, for uh, construction projects, uh, the main permit would usually be the one from uh, the county governance uh, for building approvals. And I had mentioned initially that uh, for the county, they would mostly be looking at the architectural designs and they'd also be looking at uh, the structural designs. And then the other permit would usually be change of user if you are trying to develop something that is different from what had been uh, set or the zoning guideline had given for that area, then you definitely need to you know, carry out a change of user. And for the change of user, we had mentioned that you would require a planner to be able to do that. Uh, then uh, there's, of course, the NEMA uh, approval. Uh, basically, when you get an EIA expert, as, as you had mentioned initially, they would uh, prepare a report which is presented to NEMA, and then NEMA would give you a license, you know, approving uh, your development project. In some projects, then you have the Kenya Civil Aviation Authority, especially if you are doing high-rise structures that are possibly along flight paths. Uh, then uh, many a times you'd require to get approval also uh, from the Kenya Civil Aviation Authority. And then there's also one other uh, agency that uh, not necessarily uh, approves because it comes after you've gotten all the approvals and you're getting into construction. Then uh, what they do is what we call project uh, registration. Um, they do project registration so that, uh, first of all, they ensure that all projects that are being constructed are linked to qualified registered contractors because the National Construction Authority, one of the mandates that they have is to maintain a register of uh, qualified contractors. So they want to create that linkage so that if there's any problem uh, with a project, then they are able to know uh, where to start uh, in terms of uh, you know doing some of these uh, some of these follow-ups, so in terms of, of approvals, essentially this is uh, what what you have. Um, in, in some cases, you might require approvals from, for instance, if you are putting up uh, educational facilities, you might require approvals from uh, uh, you know a ministry uh, of education. Um, you might require, if you're doing a health project, then you possibly might require uh, I mean, approval from the Ministry of Health, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the, of the you know, permits that you definitely require as you get into a project. Um, another question that has uh, recurred is about uh, a building contractor. And uh, a lot of people have been asking, you know, uh, should I use um, a building contractor in my project or not? Or can you build a project um, uh, without a building uh, contractor? So uh, you can't build a project without a contractor. The question is usually who that contractor is. Uh, but uh, from a very technical and practical uh, point of view, you must have a building contractor. Um, in many cases, and, and what we've seen, is that uh, the owners or the developers of the project usurp that role of a building contractor. And, and they do this when they get um, uh, a foreman uh, or uh, a fundi, and then they supply the materials and, 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 and you know, basically manage the process. So that is what a contractor does. Just manage the resources and ensuring that the project 
is, is, is you know, properly planned and uh, properly implemented. So you cannot avoid a contractor. The question is who that contractor is. It can either be a professional uh, registered building contractor uh, who understands uh, you know, uh, these processes, who understands quality of projects, uh, who knows you know, where to get uh, you know, materials from, and so on and so forth. Or you do it yourself. If you have the knowledge, if you have the experience, if you have the networks, then it's okay and, and, and it works. It has worked for very many people. But it becomes a problem if uh, you know you are trying things out, and uh, it it can get really, really, really messy. So, basically, looking at the contractor, I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of the positives of having a professional contractor. If you, as an individual, um, is not a professional contractor, and, and the reason why I'm calling, I'm putting it that way, is because uh, even at a personal level, when I'm putting up my own project. <clears throat> because I'm a professional and I understand the trade, then I would do it myself. I would not go out looking for you know a different contractor. But uh, if you it's if it's not your trade, if it's not what you do, then uh, it's important that you get a qualified and professional contractor. The positives, the first of all, is that uh, there is what I've called no hassle services. You get into an agreement with this contractor, you just give them your, your dreams, uh, you get them the designs properly done by you know, your architect, and you get into an agreement that they deliver what it is that uh, has been designed. So your role would definitely just be to facilitate <coughs> that delivery process. But in terms of uh, time, uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of your time because to plan some of these logistics when you have usurped the role of a contractor, it becomes very difficult. And uh, you expose yourself to a lot of risks. Uh, you know, things get stolen. Uh, some of these suppliers, you know, can play around with you. So whatever it is that you're trying to save, then you end up not actually saving it. So it's good when you, you know, get into an agreement with a contractor, you have your, your expectations, they have the expectations, you agree and then everyone gets to do what it is that is expected of them, then that works, usually works uh, really, really well. Um, when you have a contractor, they become uh, you know, a single point of contact within the project. So you don't have to deal with uh, this supplier, you don't have to deal with this fundi, you, know, you don't have to deal with you know, that other issue. So you only have one point through which you uh, issues are dealt with. So it, 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 eases a lot of trouble, uh, you know, from, from uh, developers. Of course, there's the aspect of professionalism because contractors have been in the business for quite some time. They understand, you know, the procedures and processes and, and documents that are required. So, uh, you know, at times when you start doing these projects by yourself and, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden people show up, you know, from a specific agency and they ask you for a certain document uh, you don't have it, then it becomes a problem. Projects get, uh, you know, interrupted, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, uh, when you engage a contractor, then you're able to cushion yourself from some of these issues. Then, of course, contractors have a lot of knowledge and experience on construction issues. They have huge networks of suppliers. So at times they tend to get materials at, at rates that uh, you might not be able to get uh, if, if, if you try it yourself. Um, so you, you get the cost benefits at times when you engage a contractor. Of course, the contractor can tell <coughs> by they ensure delivery of quality works uh, because at times uh, as individuals, we might not be able um, to tell the difference between a good wall, a straight wall and the one that is crooked, uh, you know, but uh, someone who has been in the trade for you know, quite some time and understands uh, their role and their work, then they're able to pick up all those aspects and all those issues. So you end up with better quality of, of uh, the works. And then of course there is, uh, if resources are provided adequately, then of course there's better time management. And uh, in the end, then it becomes uh, cost effective, uh, you know, to build. Um, so the other item that, uh, you know, questions have been asked about has been uh, the aspect of budgets and uh, timelines. I've, I've, uh, if you look at these uh, 
this this meme that I've, I've pasted there, um, uh, it talks about what clients always expect uh, from consultants. And the next uh, image uh, just shows you the budgets that clients usually have put uh, for the same expectations that they usually have. So uh, the issue of budget is critical and, and we come across it uh, whenever we engage in, uh, in projects. Um, I've never met a client who has ever had you know, adequate funds uh, for their projects. So they would always have inadequate budgets, they would always want to save on costs. So this is an issue that we must tackle when you're getting into, into projects. So I looked at some of the cost factors that uh, you know, if, if, if you uh, have budget constraints, <clears throat> then how do you approach? Well, if, if you have the opportunity to do site selection, it's important because uh, the site can also really help in terms of lowering uh, your, your budgets. I talked about the soil conditions. If, for instance, you choose a site that has two meters of black cotton soil, someone else chooses a site that has only one meter of black cotton soil. So, you know, your costs of excavation, your costs of backfilling would be different. You know, one would be double, the other one would be, you know, half uh, the other one. So it's important when you're doing your site selection. Uh, the other issue is usually the size of, of uh, development. I would meet a client would come and tell me, you know, I'd want a six bedroom, you know, house, you know, these bedrooms should be this big. Uh, these are the qualities of, 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 of tiles that I want. This is the roof that I want. And then uh, you ask about the budget, then they give you a budget for a two bedroom house. So it's important. If, if you want to build cheaper, then build small. Uh, but know that if, if, if the bigger the development, the more costly um, uh, it is going to be. The other issue usually is uh, how complex are the designs. And, and uh, in School of Architecture, we uh, normally have some of these sayings that uh, less is more. Okay, less is more meaning that uh, I don't want to make things too complex because when you make them very complex, then they become very difficult to implement. And in the end, then they even cost you more. So much simpler designs, you know, straightforward, straight edges. If you have roofs that are not very complicated, with very few corners, they're very easy to fix, cheaper to fix. And even in terms of maintenance, you don't have a lot of failures uh, in terms of, you know, maintaining some of these uh, spaces. Um, but you know, these are issues to do with preference. You know, people would prefer things to be done differently. But this is just a point to note that <clears throat> if you want something that could be cheaper, then you need to look at your design and, and go for a much simpler uh, design and have it you know, very, well, uh, uh, very well detailed. Of course, there is the aspect of choice of uh, finishes, uh, fittings, and installations. Uh, you know, roofs have different prices. You can do the usual mabati that is very cheap, but of course uh, you compromise on the looks. But then you can do the stone coated tiles, you can do the clay tiles, you can do shingles, which are some of the most expensive. So you can see how to go about it. And, and, and the example I like giving is between shingles and stone coated tiles, because stone coated tiles, the cost is almost half that of shingles but you can get uh, some tiles that give you a profile that looks like shingles. So you end up getting a look that, that is almost like shingles, uh, different, but uh, you know, at a much more cost-effective uh, uh, cost. Um, the other question is, uh, how do you go about contracting? Do you give out a full contract? Do you give out a labor contract? <clears throat> As I'd mentioned initially, um, uh, uh, when you give a full contract, essentially you're not the contractor. So the contractor is spending their time, effort, and resources. So you pay them, and it's usually a percentage, which is, is the profit. So when you give out a labor contract, uh, and, and, and when you give out a labor contract, you still are the contractor because you have to organize the resources and, and, and the rest. So what happens is that uh, you can save. There's potential to save on the profit 
that the contractor was going to make if you had given them um, a full contract. Uh, but that potential, you can only take advantage of it if you understand construction. But if you don't, as, as you had mentioned, it can be problematic. You know, you can end up with very poor quality of works because you take up the, the whole risk of the project. If something goes wrong in, in, in a project, uh, if it was a full contract, you just go and ask the contractor demolish and uh, repair. Uh, but if it's in a labor contract, you still incur the costs because you are the, full, you are, you are the contractor. So th there are those risks that you need to look at as you, as you decide the direction to go. But definitely, if you understand the trade, if you know what to do, then a labor contract is usually cheaper uh, than when you give out a full, a full contract. And of course, uh, it's important, and I always mention it, to use uh, professional consultants in the whole construction process so that they take you through uh, you know, the process from, from beginning um, to the end. And, and if you use your consultants very well, uh, they prepare the designs for you properly. You interrogate the designs. Many a times, <clears throat> I would prepare designs and give them to my clients. And I would imagine that they, they, they understand, but they don't, they can't visualize some of these spaces. So at times I'm forced to take a tape measure and, and you, know, I, I, you know, pull it and tell them, you know, your sitting room is five meters wide and this is five meters. So that they're able to visualize. Because at times someone would see five meters on a drawing, um, they would think it's either adequate and, and when you start building it up, then they say, no, this is too big. So there are these issues that, uh, when you engage consultants and you utilize them properly, then you're able to make all these decisions on paper. And once you've locked it and you've gone to site, if you're able to uh, implement your project without having to do any changes, without having to make any amendments, then it ends up being much, much cheaper um, than you know, uh, the other way around. So, <clears throat> um, I received a number of, of, of questions from uh, some of you. Uh, so I've, I've, I've uh, tackled you know, some of them. I think you can go through them. And then definitely I would uh, allow you to you know, uh, ask uh, any questions that you might, uh, you might have. Um, uh, so the first question is I would wish to uh, build shops and bed sitters. And I'm working with a very lean budget. Of course, you mentioned this issue of budget. Everyone. No one has uh, enough budget. I think it's only the Arabs in the Gulf who uh, have budget, big budgets for projects. <clears throat> so the question is, how can I manage the costs without affecting quality? And should I engage a building contractor? Um, uh, so the first answer is build small, if it makes sense. Okay, um, uh, if it doesn't make sense, then uh, you have, the other option you have is to face the project probably. And facing the project is good because what it does is that it gives you an opportunity to build a smaller section, complete it, and, and uh, start using it uh, as you build the other section. So it, it helps because at times you'd find that people engage in projects which are you know, too big, and then they get stuck in the middle, then they have sunk uh, their capital, and, and they cannot you know, get any benefit from, from that capital that they've put in there. So I think it's important that uh, if, if you can't build small, because the way it looks and, and the kind of project you're talking about, bed sitters and, uh, and shops, so this is not a small project. So the only way out I'm seeing is, uh, is uh, if you're able to face the project. And of course, engage a contractor. I think a project of this magnitude and size, the risks are too huge. Uh, it, it would be good if you're able to, to engage a contractor because they're going to ease a lot of the pressure from, uh, uh, from you. Um, so, well, with the current COVID-19 situation globally and even locally, is the real estate still a viable investment sector? Um, you're putting me in a position where I, I should uh, give an objective <clears throat> um, um, response uh, to, to, to something that I have very high interests in. But still, I think uh, my, my thoughts are that uh, there have been many pandemics before and, and they've come. 
and they've gone. And, and uh, I don't think they took away the need for, uh, for real estate. Although the reality is that there are some sectors that have been badly hit. Uh, one of them that I've seen is the hospitality sector uh, because uh, you know people are not moving around, so people are not staying in hotels. Uh, so hotels are closing down. <coughs> so it might not make sense to, to uh, you know, to want to invest in a hotel now. But uh, as I said, you know, um, uh, the pandemic is going to go away. So, and, and people will still travel in future. So if it's an area that you're still interested in, maybe you can, you can just slow down, but not, you know, quit entirely because definitely um, it's going to, to recover. If you're building your own home, I think there's no question about, uh, you know, COVID. So you still go ahead and, and, uh, <coughs> and do it. Excuse me. Um, uh, the other question is how uh, should one navigate contracts where they are dependent on income from a regular job uh, to finance a project? Um, uh, projects are costly to, to, to develop. They're quite costly. Uh, so it's important that you, um, you do proper proper planning and, and proper planning that is uh, financially. Uh, but unless, you know, you earn like, you know, a million a month or something of that sort, uh, and then that's when you're able to, to have a substantial amount monthly. And that's if you put your entire million into, into a project. You know, that, that's the only time that you have a sub substantial amount to, you know, put in a project that, you know, is going to make sense. Uh, but uh, what I would advise, you know, someone does is that you either save, uh, you know, you want to build uh, a home and you know it's going to cost, you know, five million, six million. Um, you can give yourself a target and say that I'm going to save maybe three million within the next two years. And you do it. Or the other way to save is take a loan. It's only that a loan, you get the money now. And then you pay for it, you know, as you, as you go. And there are many options you can get from banks. You can get from circles. You know, if you have rich uh, relatives and friends, you can talk to them. And then uh, you get the funds to do your project. And then you pay them slowly. A reason being that uh, when you do some of these uh, works in small bits and pieces, it, it becomes too costly. So it's always good. You don't benefit from... <clears throat> from economies of, of scale, uh, you don't benefit from proper timing and scheduling of, of, of activities and, and works. Uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, works that need to be joined properly together. And, and, and uh, you know, when you plaster one side of the wall and then you come to plaster the second side the following month, you know, those two sides don't gel really well. And, and in the end, they definitely are going to bring you some issues. So it's always good if you're able to plan your finances well and, and, and have fun, adequate funds uh, to run your project. Um, there's an interesting question about uh, how to build in very hot uh, climates and, and, and what design and material <coughs> is recommended. Um, if, if, and, and, and you know, my response is that if you just look around that area, uh, you'd see these responses. They are there. People have, have been doing it since time immemorial. And, and, and uh, uh, the trick is in the materials. You get very thick uh, uh, stones. The idea is that uh, uh, when you have a thick stone, it takes a longer time for the heat to move from the outside of the stone to you know, inside. <clears throat> Your roof also needs to be heavy. Uh, you're looking at concrete roof slabs, uh, you know, that's what you'd see in most uh, hot areas. And concrete roof slabs give you another advantage, that they give you an open space where you can also go and relax, you know, when it's too hot uh, inside. Uh, you need to have openings that allow for cross ventilation, but then again, you also sh have to shade the openings so that they're not hit by direct sunlight, because when they're hit by direct sunlight, then it means it's very easy for you know the heat uh, to move from outside the um, the building 
to inside. So those are some of the of the things that you can look at. And of course, in design, um, you know, we build with a lot of uh, with a lot of balconies, bigger rooms, uh, so that you know the volume is much bigger, and uh, you know there is better air circulation. We do high ceilings. So those are some of the aspects that that, that you look at when you are looking specifically uh, at the design. And then uh, there's one question uh, about the cost of uh, construction projects. And uh, the person who asked this question uh, asked specifically for residential <coughs> and commercial projects. So the Institute of Quantity Surveyors usually develops a, a handbook uh, that we normally use as, as professionals to guide us as we advise you. And uh, what the handbook uh, looks at is, uh, I know, recently constructed projects. Uh, you know, for instance, a residential house that has been fully constructed and finished to a specific uh, quality of material and finishes. And uh, we look at the cost of that project. And then you look at how big the project is in terms of square meters. So we divide the cost of the project by the number of square meters, and then we get what we call a cost per per square meter. So this is what, when you engage or when you encounter uh, a professional in construction, they would always tell you that, you know, this building is going to cost this much uh, per square meter. So this uh, is the one for 2018 and 2019. So for 2020, 2021 is not yet out, but it's uh, being updated. Uh, and in it, there are various costs for different types of uh, of construction projects. And uh, we've looked also at different areas. Uh, so for instance, the first one here you're seeing is uh, commercial projects. <clears throat> and for commercial projects, you're looking at uh, Nairobi area, you're looking at coastal area, and you're also looking at uh, you know Western area and Rift Valley. So different uh, you know types of construction. So we have low rise office blocks, you have high rise. <coughs> so you'd, you'd notice that as you go upper, it becomes more expensive. So this is the cost per square meter. So if it is low rise up to four stories, you're looking at 40,000 per, per square meter. Uh, high rise, you're looking at 52,000. Um, if you are looking at grade A offices, there's a way these commercial projects are graded. Uh, so if you're looking at grade A, it's 61,000. And then when you have prestige, what you call prestige offices, you're looking at 70,000 per, per square meters. So it, it also gives for industrial complexes, when you're looking at factories, warehouses. Um, uh, it, it also gives for <coughs> you know, social centers. It also gives for hotels. Hotels, depending on the star rating. So if you're building a two-star hotel, you're looking at a cost of about 69,000. Uh, per square meter, and, and that is to fully construct and, and, and equip with all the adequate fittings for it to operate as, um, as a hotel. You know, if you're looking at a resort, you're looking at 85,000 uh, per square meter, then you have the health facilities. And of course, uh, what interests a lot of people is this one on uh, uh, residential. So for residential, um, you have quite a number uh, of different uh, classes of, of residential uh, houses. You have high class uh, measurements. High class measurements are the ones you'd possibly find in uh, places like Runda, in places like Karen. So those ones would cost about 50,000 per square meter. A high class meaning you know, very high quality finishes. The floors, you use mahogany instead of ceramic tiles. Um, you know, roofs, you use uh, shingles instead of stone-coated tiles. So that is what makes it <coughs> get to, 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 to that level in terms of uh, pricing. Luxury apartments, similar. Uh, could be slightly more expensive because now luxury apartments, you go high-rise. Um, uh, Middle-income apartments, uh, you're looking at about 45,000 uh, uh, per square meter. This is what you would find in a lot of areas in uh, Mombasa Road, in uh, South Sea, and, and uh, you know, some parts of Kilelesho and so on and so forth. 
These ones you'd find in Lovington, in Riverside, and the likes. And then, of course, you have these uh, medium standard uh, townhouses. You know what people are building in uh, Siokimau, uh, what people are building in uh, Kitengela, and the likes. So this is what you are you are you know looking at. And then, uh, of course, there's uh, low-rise apartment blocks, you know, duplex townhouses. Um, uh, you have these private dwelling houses. Uh, this would be the cheapest <coughs> at uh, 33,667. This is fairly standard. Um, uh, no uh, luxuries. You're just looking at ceramic tiles in all your, your floors. You're looking at... Uh, at uh, steel roofing sheets, not even stone-coated uh, tiles, and so on and so forth. So this is what you can achieve at around that price. <coughs> Excuse me. So 30,000 is, is, is what you, a lot of people have been quoting when they're talking about uh, construction projects, but that would be on the lowest. What we call outbuildings here, uh, you know, like when you're building a servant's quarters, uh, you're building a gate house, and, and you're not putting a lot of of uh, effort into you know doing it, so that is why it it would be the cheapest at that cost of about thirty thousand uh, per square meter. So essentially, on uh, the costs of construction, uh, that is what we have, and uh, this also brings us to the end of uh, the presentation that uh, that I had uh, prepared for you. So at this juncture. I would like to invite uh, the participants to, you know, raise any queries, any questions that uh, uh, that they have, and I can definitely react to them. I've seen um, there's a question already uh, in the chat from uh, Tekla. Uh, what's your opinion on alternative housing? construction, for instance, containers adapted for housing. Is it possible in Kenya and how? Um, well, there, there are quite a number of, 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 of alternative uh, housing technologies, and, and I think containers is, is one of them. Uh, we've tried to utilize them in projects, but they come with their own challenges. Uh, the first challenge being that the size, you know, containers have specific uh, sizes, which are usually lower than, even in terms of the width, uh, the width of a container is about 2.2 2 .2 meters <coughs> or 2.4 meters, which is less than an ideal width for any, any room other than, you know, a washroom or something of that sort. So for you to be able to come up with something that works really well, you know, with a container. You have to do a lot of playing around with, you know, many different containers. So you have to get one and cut it out, and then you join it with another. And, and the, the idea of a container being a more cost-effective uh, form of construction is when you are able to use it as a container without having to cut it out. Because by the time you start cutting it out, it increases costs of cutting and joining and, and doing a lot of finishes. So it's if if you are using it just to do uh, shops or kiosks, for instance, then it works. But if you want to use it to do uh, something that requires wider uh, spaces, where now you need to start joining different containers, then it becomes uh, you know very difficult, and it also becomes costly. In addition to that, a container is mabati, and mabati the way they behave when it's hot, it's hot, it becomes too hot. When it's cold, it also becomes too cold. So uh, what happens is that uh, you need to insulate it. Insulation, so which means you need to put another layer of surface on the inner part and then in between, you know, put in some insulation material, which in the end might also become costly. So um, if, if you have a certain module that you want to build that requires the dimensions of a container, then it becomes cheap because you bring the container, you place it, <coughs> you just finish it and you use it. But if you need to do a bit of uh, amendments here and there, then it becomes a bit, uh, a bit costly. Uh, uh, 
Uh, there's another question I'm uh, seeing here from, uh, from Victoria uh, with regards to the differences in construction cost per square meter. Uh, how come high rises in Mombasa and Western regions are more expensive uh, compared to, uh, to Nairobi? Uh, then the smaller projects like individual dwellings in Mombasa are cheaper uh, than in uh, than in Nairobi. Um, uh, generally, uh, Mombasa costs are slightly more expensive because of how you would need, and also Western, <coughs> because of what you'd need to to treat uh, to to treat the the how you'd need to treat the materials because of the aspect of, uh, of weather. Um, you'd find quite a lot of uh, the Mombasa projects where you might not be able to do a normal Mabati roof. <coughs> so it means you have to do a, a proper concrete slab and you have to properly waterproof it, which makes it uh, you know, slightly more costly. And then uh, um, other areas, there's, there's always this, um, uh, thinking that if you're building in the rural areas, it, it should be cheaper than in Nairobi, where, whereas the, the inverse is true, because the uh, majority of the building materials are manufactured, you know, either within or around Nairobi. And, and the aspect of uh, transportation of these materials usually adds up to, to the cost of, of uh, construction. So like, uh, you know, when you're building in Western, all your building stones, you know, they would likely come from, from Nairobi because there are some quarries in Rift Valley, but they don't have uh, as good quality of stones as you'd have in, uh, in Juja. So those are some of the challenges. That's why you'd see uh, some of these uh, developments that are further away from the city. Uh, they are more costly to, to develop as compared to the ones within the city. And also in Nairobi, when you want to get good, uh, uh, good laborers, uh, you know, good fundies, it's cheaper because this is their home. Um, uh, they live around here, they work here. So you'd pay them much cheaper than if you were to, uh, to you know, get a fundi and shuttle them to an area you know, out, of, uh, out of Nairobi. So those are some of the uh, issues that usually uh, make construction out of Nairobi slightly more, more costly. Um, uh, another question I'm seeing here from Alex. Uh, you mentioned you can face a project uh, into, say, four phases to manage the costs. Can the developer get an occupation certificate for phase one in order to get income uh, to help building the other three phases in Nairobi? <coughs> this is uh, usually a, 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 a difficult one because by the, before you get an occupation certificate, uh, you must have completed the construction project. Um, so if, if you complete the ground floor, then it means the other three floors are still, uh, you know, construction sites. And uh, if, if they're still construction sites, then, uh, uh, you know, you are not ideally allowed to have people living um, in, uh, in a construction site. <clears throat> the best way, in my view, to face a high-rise project is, is um, even in a situation like, like yours, because you don't want to have tenants on ground floor, and then you are coming to cast uh, the, 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 you know, the first floor, you know, the concrete works, they are very noisy, they are very messy and very dangerous. So the way I would look at facing such a project is you start with the shell first, that you do the shell for all the four floors, uh, and then you are done with all your major concrete wet works. And then now you, the second phase would be the finishing works. And this one you can very easily do per floor because uh, what would happen is that the fundies would be working from inside the building as opposed to outside. So that could be one of the best ways to, to face a high rise, a high rise project. Um, it happens, we've, we've seen it happen in Nairobi where someone builds ground floor and then people come in, but, but uh, it's, it's not allowed officially. And also, it, it might not be an ideal way to, uh, you know, to face your, your project. Um, and then there's Oli. Um, how does one go, go about building an incomplete house? 
<clears throat> where you get finishes, some doors, paintworks, just to mention a few. Uh, how does one go about building an incomplete house? Oli, I am, uh, if you can hear me, I don't know whether I, if you can clarify the question. I'm not getting it properly. Are you able to unmute and uh, clarify the question? Hello, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, yes, so the question is, eh? Yes. The instances where maybe someone doesn't have enough finances, eh? I think you had discussed partially about that, eh? Yes. So the thing is, uh, there are situations where, let's say I have a budget of, uh, let's say around 5M, but the house that I want costs around, uh, let's say around 8 million. But you see, uh, if I have this 5 million, I would want to put up something and move in, but I'll do the rest later as, a, as I continue occupying the house. You understand? Yes. So there's a balance. Uh, so I don't know whether financiers are able to accept such kind of an arrangement or for them they go for complete projects. Only. Well, at, at what point would you want them to finance? Is it, is it the start From or the, the end? No, no, no. From the start. <clears throat> From the start, it might be difficult because uh, I would imagine most financiers would use the same project as, uh, as security. Okay. Uh, and uh, they would want, uh, first of all, to ensure that when they're financing it, that the project would be concluded so that, uh, you know, uh, they, they assume when you get the economic benefit is when also your ability to repay uh, is going to be better. So okay. it's going to be very difficult for a financier to finance a project when they know the money they are giving is not going to conclude. What they would do usually is if, if you're able to put in your own funds at the onset mm -hmm. and then you take the yeah. project to a, a good uh, level, then most of them yeah. can very easily come in and finance the remainder. And of course, they'll take the whole project as security because you know, their money is, is much better secured that way. But, but I think it yeah, would be yeah. easier that way, as opposed to when they are financing, knowing clearly that uh, you're not going to conclude the, the works. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then... Uh, <clears throat> uh, Nasir has asked uh, some two questions. Uh, the first one is how to to deal with uh, a <coughs> breach of contract. Um, I, I know majority of uh, people who engage in smaller develop development projects uh, usually don't um, uh, have you know, solid uh, contracts for, for construction. Solid meaning you know, the ones that are guided by what we call the Joint Building Council that, that usually prepares and administers these contracts. So when there's breach of contract, um, you know, the only uh, avenue that one has is, you know, the document that they signed with, uh, with uh, whoever, you know, the contractor was and whether that can be admissible, you know, in any, any uh, you know, entity that can deal with it. But uh, if you had, a proper contract that uh, you know is governed by the Joint Building Council, which has also been registered at the AG's office. It's usually very easy because it has remedies for breach. You know, it depends what the breach is. Um, have you paid your contractor and they didn't deliver? Um, there's a remedy for that. Uh, have you uh, have they done poor quality work? Works. You know, there's a remedy for that. There are quite a number of remedies that deal with some of these uh, uh, specific issues. So when you get uh, into a contract on the basis of that Joint Building Council uh, contract, then it gives all those scenarios and, and it's going to be much easier uh, to deal with issues when they arise, uh, you know, as you've mentioned, the breach of uh, contract. And then the second question is, uh, is it possible to start with one's budget dream uh, before the project house dream? Um, 
uh, it is possible to start with, uh, with, with a dream budget. Uh, but I usually tell people it, it has to have some basis uh, because you cannot wake up today and then you decide that I want to build a house worth half a million shillings. So what, what, what basis are you using to, to come up with that budget? So the basis, I mean, um, do you know someone who has built a house that you like? Yes. How much did they tell you the house would cost? You know, 5 million, 10 million. So then you can say, well, I don't have 5 million, but maybe I can raise 3 million. Then you can come and say, yes, um, uh, I want, uh, I have 3 million to, to build a house. Yes, 3 million can build a house, but it might not give you whatever it is that you had wanted. And then now the question would be, how do you merge the budget with your dream or the brief that you want to, to develop? So you can start with the budget, but it must have a basis that is, uh, is uh, you know, it, it, it makes sense. There has to be a reason why uh, you picked that uh, that figure, and it should also be a realistic uh, figure. So I hope Nasir have uh, responded to your <coughs> to your questions. And then uh, uh, there is KK. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, you said an amazing presentation. What is your opinion? on the high-rise apartments along Gong Road built by the Chinese, <clears throat> and also on the purchase of land that has a lease of below 30 years, would you advise someone to, to purchase? Yes, um, um, the, the high-rise apartments um, along Gong Road, uh, I have mixed uh, opinions because I've seen really, really good ones. Uh, good ones, meaning they've, they've been done very well, they, they are spacious and uh, you know, good quality, but I've also seen the inverse where they're very poor quality, badly done, uh, congested, uh, you know, poorly ventilated, and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it depends on, on where you land. If, if, if you uh, are looking at, at, at buying an, an apartment along Gong Road, then you have to do your homework really, really well so that you don't end up with uh, a poor quality, uh, you know, uh, uh, investment to a poor quality apartment. <clears throat> and then uh, the purchase of land that has a lease of below 30 years. Well, um, there are a number of things you need to look at. The first one is the cost of, of, of purchase <clears throat> because natural, normally leases are 99 years. So it means if you're buying 30 years, then uh, you, you need to look at the, the market forces and see what benefit are you going to get <coughs> from that 30 years. Mainly because after the 30 years are over, then uh, you'll need to renew the lease. And renewing the lease would be like buying the, the property afresh. But I think you can do it because even uh, when you're renewing the lease, as, uh, as uh, the current owner, you're given the initial uh, opportunity to renew the lease, you know, before it's put out uh, in the open. So I think if, if you're getting a good deal and uh, you're able to uh, um, um, you know, uh, organize yourself so that when the lease uh, ends, then you're able to renew it, then I think you should go for it. And then uh, Nasir again, uh, design and build. Uh, uh, tell us more. What are the what are the advantages? Uh, well, um, the main advantage is that uh, the person who does the design, <coughs> who basically uh, is, is in a better place and understands uh, the design better, then is able to, to implement it. Uh, what you need to to ensure is that. Uh, you get the right, the right contract uh, for design and build because uh, what we normally do and why we separate a construction from design is so that we have the independence. You have your architect who can come in and look at the construction project and you know, tell you objectively that your contractor is, uh, is uh, not doing the right thing. So when, when uh, the architect is, is also, or the, when the designer is also the contractor, uh, then it means you need to you know find a way of 
really properly uh, you know protecting yourself um, I think those are all the questions that I that I had uh, from the chat so if there's anyone with an additional question you have about uh, 10 more minutes I think I would welcome anyone who has a question to ask Hi, sorry, um, Tyro, this is Tekla. Yes, Tekla, hi. Hi, sorry, I got cut off, uh, disconnected when I asked that question about the containers. Do you mind res re responding to that again? Yes, Paul. Um, uh, so essentially what uh, I had uh, uh, um, mentioned is that uh, containers, come with a lot of limitations. And one of the limitation is uh, the size of the container because it comes in a module, which is about 2.2 or 2.4 meters wide. <clears throat> and uh, that width is, is not ideal, you know, for a, a good, you know, habitable space. So what okay. would happen is if, if you'd want to put up a proper structure, then it means you have to combine containers. You have to bring two containers together and then you have to cut mm -hmm. off the side and then you start joining. So the moment mm -hmm. you start cutting off the container, then you lose the advantage because the advantage of the container was you being able to use it when it is just as a container. You bring it, you place it, and then you do minor modifications and then you, you use it. But the moment you start cutting and, and joining and, and, and so on and so forth, then the cost advantage disappears and the other challenge again is the mm. material and I, I, mm. I mentioned that uh, because it is made of steel which uh, yeah. gets too hot or too cold depending on whether it's hot or cold then at times you mm. need to insulate it so you have to put uh, another surface internally and then you put an insulation material in between and, and by the time you get to do that then the costs uh, definitely go up so it would oh. be good if you uh, putting up a module that takes mm -hmm. the same size as the container. If you're putting the bandas, for instance, then you just bring it yeah. in and place it and you cut off the doors and you start using it. Okay. Yes. Okay. I was, I was just checking on that because as a viable option um, in terms of cost cutting. And would it, be, would it even be accepted in, uh, in Kenya as a, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a residential? Because honestly, some yeah. of the some of the plots, you know, the plots I'm talking about, the plots people build, one roomed plots, mm -hmm. are more or less that size. Yes. So if you wanted to build a number of plots, you could do you could use those containers. But is it unacceptable? Is it accepted in Kenya uh, by the uh, authorities? All the the ones that you have mentioned, according to the current uh, building code. Um, mm. You know, containers are classified as mabati, which yes. should be a temporary structure. Okay. So it, it is definitely acceptable, but it is acceptable as a temporary structure. Although the building mm -hmm. code is being, uh, is being uh, amended, actually mm -hmm. the law that is amending the building code has already been signed, uh, has been assented by the president. So some of these new alternative uh, technologies and materials have been captured mm. in that uh, amended uh, uh, building code, and, and and one of them is steel as 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 as, as a material for you know walling uh, in construction. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And the other thing is when you are talking about insulation, uh, something like that. When you uh, when you would want to insulate, mm -hmm. you can tell I'm seriously considering this. So yes. when you want to insulate, would you use what would what form of insulation would you suggest as preferable to using? Would it be wood or would it be cement again? Well, um, when you uh, work with a container, because the, the the nature of the container itself is what we call dry dry construction. Dry construction yes. meaning you don't use water because it's just metal, you cut it and you weld it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, what, what I would propose as insulation would be, you can use either gypsum board internally 
and then okay. uh, you know when you use it internally in between the gypsum and the, and the container externally you have a space inside which mm. acts as insulation uh, but uh, oh, if if need be again you can put there are some insulation materials some isolation uh, fibers that you can put in between to even give mm. much more insulation so it means it prevents any heat from uh, air yeah. into the container or heat or from inside escaping to the outside to the outside okay. yes yes yeah okay thank you uh, karibu yeah and thanks so much for the for the presentation it was very useful <laughs> uh, sante, sante. very informative Fine. It's, it's my pleasure. Okay. I think uh, you can also leave your. No, I have your email addresses. So what I'll do is uh, I'll share the the PowerPoint uh, with all of you. After, after. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay, so I'm seeing one more question. I think uh, this should uh, possibly be the last question. Um, uh, from uh, Alex, asking whether we undertake projects from. Uh, uh, where other architects have designed? Yes, we do. And uh, um, are they geared? Um, are they aligned to lean budget clients? Oh well, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, uh, the, the budget would definitely be dependent on the design and, and specification. So I think depending on what uh, the architect has designed and specified, essentially that is what is going to, to, to determine uh, the budget that you're going to have for, for the project. So I would not say uh, no, uh, because of course we, we are sensitive to budgets, but then I would, I would uh, be careful not to say yes, and, and then uh, you know, raise your expectations a bit, uh, a bit too high. And then uh, I'm seeing uh, Boaz has asked a question. Let me look for it. Uh, great. Um, uh, uh, is the construction industry, both consultants and contractors, ready for the changes that will be required in all habitable working spaces after the crisis? Uh, like provision of water uh, in 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 uh, wet areas. Yes, I think uh, this is an interesting. It's an interesting crisis, and and uh, as as uh, architects, I, you know, it's what we have always been seeing about in the school of architecture, and even as we go about uh, working on our projects, um, we usually talk about the TB pandemic in uh, the US in the 19, I think 1940s or 1950s, which uh, gave rise to this modernist uh, movement of architecture where, you know, buildings are designed with very huge airy openings that admit in a lot of light, uh, you know, bigger spaces in terms of even how, uh, you know, the interiors have been worked out, uh, you know, to try and improve the space to you know, make the recovery of a patient much uh, easier and faster because um, at that time, uh, other than antibiotics, one other aspect that uh, the doctors were using to treat the TB was uh, getting the patients to just sit in an airy place and, you know, have access to adequate sunlight and so on and so forth. So definitely in terms of uh, architects, you know, adapting our designs, to the challenges that have been brought about by the existing pandemic, definitely, and it's something that we are, you know, engaging on heavily within our circles, you know, to see how can we improve, you know, the spaces that we create for, for people, uh, make them better, you know, for, for their living. So definitely the current pandemic is going to have an impact in terms of how we do our work uh, moving forward. Yeah, so I think uh, that's it. Um, uh, but unless there's any other, I can take, I think, one other burning question um, from anyone. 
uh, I think uh, there is none. So I'd like to thank you all, you know, for taking your time and uh, joining us for this presentation. I will definitely share it uh, uh, with all of you. And uh, this is something that we'd be doing it uh, every so often. So you can be joining us also in our future sessions where we'll be handling um, uh, different aspects of, uh, of construction. So thank you very much and uh, keep safe. And uh, we do hope to work with you in future. So I'm tennis, Sana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Asante, Sana. Ah, karibu, karibu. Thank you. Thank you.